Thanks for watching CBS 8 Plus and welcome to this throwback special. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. We've been covering San Diego for more than 70 years now and have had a front row in watching it grow and change. In this throwback special, we dove into our CBS 8 archives and found something as synonymous with San Diego as fish tacos, the zoo and Ron Burgundy. It's Comic-Con. We know it as the biggest and longest running pop culture convention and celebration in the world. And its humble beginnings were actually seated in the Big Apple. But as it branched out, embracing Hollywood and its blockbuster machine, its founder felt that it strayed too far from its roots. Jeff Zevely starts us out with his story on comic book superfan, Shel Dorf. The year was 1970 when a 37 year old Southern California transplant from Detroit moved here to San Diego and had a vision. Before 130,000 people showed up to Comic Con, 300 diehards gathered in the basement of the U.S. Grant Hotel 41 years ago for the very first show. Shell was a guy who wanted to live on the wild side. Comic book yeah, dealer Terry Stroud says his buddy Shell Dorf waltzed into San Diego and wasn't afraid to dream big. I think he was influenced by the New York shows. Shell Dorf was a fierce fan of comic books, so he rallied his closest friends to organize the first Comic Con in 1970. I've been to every one of them. Comic book historian Robert Bierbaum is one of four people who's attended every single Single show. Robert says Shell stopped going to Comic Con because he thought it grew too big and strayed from its roots. All the big Hollywood studios are simply using this as a, a, a vehicle with which to pr promote, make it to make millions and millions of dollars off of this stuff. And you forget the essence of why did you go to the movie theater in the first place? Shell Dorf died last November from complications related to diabetes, but he'll always be remembered for helping to launch hundreds of comic book careers. I came to San Diego in 1975. Dave Scroge has made a living off the industry his dear friend Shell helped put on the map and for that he'll always be grateful. Where would your career have been without Shell Dorf? Oh that's hard to say maybe I'd still be cooking in restaurants my god it's an impossible question to answer. All right in the beginning back in the 1970s Comic Con was very much a celebration of comics and the artists who brought them to life. Where else could you meet the man who's created Bugs Bunny? It was also a chance to find out whether sci-fi legend author Ray Bradbury thought that comics were actually art. By the end of the decade, the prices on collector's editions of comics were starting to rise to a whole new stratosphere, and the event itself was just starting to feel the power of the force. This year's conclave has a little of everything to offer, with discussions and exhibits focusing on comic books, comic strips, science fiction, fantasy, and the age of chivalry. Guest speaker for the three-day event is former San Diegan Bob Clampett, creator of the popular cartoon characters Bugs Bunny, Tweety Pie, and Cecil the Seasick Sea Serpent. Clampett explained the sources of inspiration for those characters. Uh, well, ideas come from many ways. Uh, for example, say on Bugs Bunny's or on Elmer Fudd's voice. Uh, when I was working on the first Merry Melody and Looney Tunes, my boss went on a rabbit hunt, Rudy Ising. We made some sketches of the rabbit outwitting him, and after that I, made a, I put on the drawing Woody Wabbit. And after that I made a series of drawings of, a, of, a, of Woody Wabbit, this little rabbit. Several years later, when I was writing the first Bugs Bunny story, uh, I used some of those gags. And then when Tex Avery and I were making about the fourth Bugs Bunny picture, uh, I was telling him about the uh, Woody Wabbit gags. And, uh, and, and the word Wabbit stuck in our mind, and it made us think of using L Arthur Q. Bryant on the voice. And that's where the, I'm looking for a little gray Wabbit uh, came what from. A, what about the idea for a Tweety Pie? Well, actually, the design of Tweety uh, <laughs> was, uh, uh, I had a baby picture my mother had up when I was a child of me in the nude with big blue eyes, the little cheeks, and nothing on. I always hated that, and so when I designed Tweety the first time, it was actually a satire on my own baby picture. <laughs> what about Cecil? You're famous for Beanie and Cecil. What about those well, ideas? Well, Cecil, uh, uh, when I was still in school, I saw a movie of, of prehistoric monsters that were animated by Willis O'Brien. And I was so impressed with it that I went home and I tried to do something with it. And I made some sketches. And then with my mother's help, uh, I made uh, the first uh, sock Cecil. Thank you. 
Clampett and other noted cartoonists will be taking part in discussions and lectures through Sunday. Cartoon and science fiction movies will also be shown during the convention. This is Maurice Luquet, TV8 News. August 1st of 1974, devotees of comic strips and comic books gathered in a convention at El Cortez Hotel where one of the major attractions was the famous writer, Ray Bradbury. He was one of America's leading science fiction authors, but also a poet, novelist, playwright, essayist, and creator of musical productions. Bradbury was a fan of the comics from his boyhood on. Our Harold Keane asked him if he considered comic books and newspaper comic strips to be genuine American art forms. Bradbury said he was planning to adapt some of his short stories into a comic magazine of his own. The Frisians and the Italians and the New York intellectuals with someone as bad as Roy Lichtenstein, who is really a dreadful artist, dreadful artist, doing all the worst things. He's, he's imitating the worst comic strips. He has no taste are discovering comic strips, you know? So these dumbbells, you know, come along and try to tell us what we knew intuitively when we were children, that this is a loving art form, and it represents the secret wishes of the men and the women who read it. The San Diego Convention opened yesterday, and already it's in high gear. Shel Dorf, founder of the local get-together of comic book buffs, says this week may break all attendance records. Superheroes are everywhere, but so are customers. And that's one major reason for the convention, share and share alike, for a profit, of course. If a 1946 issue of Donald Duck in fine condition can bring $150, it's only natural that the first Donald Duck comic drawn by artist Carl Bark in 1942 would go for just $850. Bill Emerson says he came all the way from New York, and this pirate gold issue is a duplicate in his collection. That's what customers and dealers stress, age and condition. It's almost like being at a stamp collector's convention. There's even a catalog, and books are rated good, fine, or mint. And that could push the price from 350 to 900 bucks. Star Trekkies can have a ball. Captain Kirk and Dr. Spock are big as life. And the rest of the crew abounds on buttons, magazines, newspapers, even books. Remember The Hobbit, the Tolkien classic? Dwarves, trolls, and Smog the Golden Dragon come alive under the skillful brush of Louis Giannolis. There's something for everyone who's ever read a comic book, from big little books of the 30s to Superman that still ranks number one today. Jim Gordon, TV8 Action News at the El Cortez. The convention offers many enthusiasts the chance to buy vintage comic books. Those that appeared first back in the late 30s are considered from the golden age. They command prices from a hundred to several thousand dollars. It's incredible since they only cost 10 cents before 1961. Batman number no. nine in mint condition costs $250 and expect to pay $250 for Flash Comics number no. two. The price jumps sharply for the August 1939 edition of Action Comics, 700 bucks. Throughout the exhibit sales area, a number of slideshows tell the story of comic strips, their creators, and characters. Ernie Chan draws Conan the Barbarian. A self-taught artist, Chan says comics are popular because of the variety of subjects they present, and it's a fun experience. On the other side, Faye Gates, a convention board member, would like better representation for women in the comics and behind the drawing boards. Convention organizers agree that science fiction has given comics a shot in the arm, and Star Wars made moviegoers stop to buy comics of the same name. But it's the fun of real space characters and toy ones that captures the imagination of all ages. With remote control in hand, you too can beep beep your way into a war on a distant planet and be home in time for dinner. Jim Gordon, News 8, The Community Concourse. About the time of Sheldor's death in 2009, uh, the late Richard Alf, who helped co-found Comic-Con, told us he couldn't believe it when Shell convinced Ray Bradbury, who you saw there, to waive his $5,000 speaking fee to appear at the convention, which was billed as a benefit for the public. By the 1980s, we were starting to see more science fiction in the world of comics and in the movies. We also saw more actors become stars on the silver screen, portraying comic book heroes, including a barbarian who would eventually become our governor. 
The costumes at the con were becoming more common and more extravagant every year, and newfangled things like video games were working their way onto the convention floor. One constant was growth. By 1985, about 5,000 people were coming. By 89, they doubled that number. If only they knew that they wouldn't even be a bad day by today's standards. Years ago, a dime gave a kid all sorts of pleasure. That's what a classic comic book used to cost. Today, after seeing what some of these comics are selling for, you shouldn't be surprised at the price of gold. It's not unusual to find comics priced at six to eight hundred dollars. The current wave of science fiction movies and the comic industry seem to be helping each other. This is the newest addition to the comic industry, a whole new language inside. But really, comic conventions deal with nostalgia. And while it's true that comic books cannot speak, you can find out how people talked, say in 1946. This is an issue of Willy Comics, and you can almost hear the talk of 1946. Golly, I'm late. Have a swell time. Jeepers holding hands in broad daylight. Shucks, Gene. Boy, it's keen. John Kalia, News 8, downtown. Talk about a way to escape reality for a while. The annual comic convention offered plenty of out-of-this-world excitement, including far-out comic books, souvenirs, and even futuristic-looking Star Wars computer games. Many were there just to expand their comic book collections, while others were there just to gaze at the galaxy of characters on hand. Some of them are weird, some of them are pretty nice, and uh, I'm just pretty serious about it. I don't go around putting crazy get-ups on and coming down here like some people do, but if that's what they want to do, that's fine. One woman was even a little miffed that the convention didn't offer more Rocky and Bullwinkle comic books. Well, I feel put upon. I really do. I, should, I flew in here, but uh, I couldn't carry that money under my arm. Uh, yeah, I would kind of like to see it. So if you missed all this madness, don't despair. They'll all be back at the same bat place, same bat date. Jesse Macias, News 8, downtown San Diego. It's hard to believe that a dozen of these conventions have already passed through San Diego. The 1981 edition will be at the San Diego Convention Center through Sunday. It's open to the public and other creatures who might wander in from distant galaxies. It's a little bit nostalgia, a little bit science fiction fantasy horror type. It's a, really a popular art festival. It uh, gathers people who appre appreciate the popular art and uh, just kind of draws them all together in one place. Sellers, buyers, and traders were out in force, splashing plenty of green for various comic books. Some, some Fantastic Fours, some few more, some Daredevils, and X-Men and Star Wars, and some magazines too. How much? $17 together. One seller parted with a 41-year-old comic book. Price? $1,200 in cash which is a considerable investment uh, potential increase from the original dime in 1940. And if you want more than just comic books, there will be guest speakers and movies throughout the four-day convention. Jesse Macias, News 8, downtown San Diego. The comic book titles, Tale of the Crypt, Iron Man, Creepy. As far as these people are concerned, that's literary greatness. Mention a comic book at some boring cocktail party in Rancho Bernardo, and you're branded a nut. No need to hide your identity here, you're among friends. Much of what appears between the pages of comic books has been used as movie material. The Conan adventure is now into its second feature film. It began in the mind of Robert Howard, tragically a troubled mind. After 23 books, Howard killed himself. Today, Conan is in the hands of Roy Thomas of Marvel Comics, who finds one part of Conan's creation fascinating. It's interesting that Howard never describes Conan's facial features, because I think he wanted the reader to put his his own face in there. Readers who see themselves in Conan's face are precisely the people Richard Fleischer, the director of the new Conan film, had in mind when the movie was made. Even the uh, locations we've always called Conan country because certain areas have the Conan look. Everything is angled for the Conan fan. Conan and all of these comics are fantasy adventure. But at the comic convention in San Diego today, there was at least one moment of doubt. This looked like a character who stepped out of the pages briefly to check the comics for accuracy. Yes, fans, a full-blown invasion of wild creatures has arrived at the community concourse for the annual comic convention. 
And you're right, sponsors tell us this year's convention is bigger and better than ever. For lovers of comic books, movie posters, and other assorted pieces of trivia, this is paradise. The convention attracts about 5,000 people over a four-day period, and though a majority of those people are interested in comic books, a lot of those people are also interested in film and whatnot. So we're not just a comic book convention, we're really a lot more. The weekend extravaganza is luring people from as far away as Yorba Linda. I picked up, uh, these are mostly first issues, things that I've needed to complete my collections. Uh, and I'm also looking around for the artists and writers to get these things autographed. Then they're worth more when I decide to sell them, if I decide to sell them, which I won't. What do you think about all the people that are here? Some of them seem a little on the strange side, don't they? Definitely. You take it with a grain of salt when you've been living with a comic collector for the last four years. Uh -oh. One of the big attractions is the Robotech comics and cartoons. It's a, an amazing story that deals uh, with uh, people's life and death that shows uh, people getting married, having children, uh, characters are dying. Something that's unique and something that you don't see on television uh, in the children's programming area. The convention is the largest of its kind in the U.S., a four-day gathering now in its 20th year. And at this event, the characters aren't just in the comic books. Some, like Devin Folk, dress the part. Have you been having a good time today? I sure have. The convention has been called the Cannes Festival of Comics, last year attracting 10,000 fans and industry people and who knows how many comic books. But it seemed like millions, standbys like Batman, Superman, Bugs Bunny. And how about this vintage copy of Archie from 1956? It was 10 cents then, $8 now. Along with the old, there's the new, like a comic book called Tales of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, very big with little kids. Kevin Eastman is co-creator. All we ever wanted to do was draw comic books. Um, that was all we'd ever wanted to do, and we had no idea. I mean, there's, you know, it's as baffling to us as probably a lot of people, you know, what makes them a success. The convention is a chance to meet established comic book artists and perhaps would-be artists. Comic book companies are always looking for talent. I just talked to a couple today that have a lot of potential, and uh, they're going to send me some stuff, and we'll filter it through the editors and see what happens. While some of this seems silly, there's a serious purpose here, promoting comic books as art. It's a true American art form, and it really is. You know, you look at uh, the range of stuff, you know, from the most, you know, like an Archie comic to graphic novels today that are, you know, bordering on science fiction. But perhaps more than anything else, it's a chance to be a kid again. Do you think you'll ever grow up? <laughs> Never. <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a big kid now. I, um, I still buy toys. I spend most of the morning buying comics and uh, things that, you know, it's my inspiration. And so I am a big kid. And he could buy a lot of toys. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles turned into a behemoth, of course, with the franchise's seventh movie set for release in the summer of 2023. As Comic-Con moved into the 90s, it had leveled up from a niche gathering to a pop culture mainstay. And talk about leveling up, Matt Groening, the man behind The Simpsons, was in to celebrate Bart and family while reminiscing on his time as a struggling comic artist in the 1980s. The con was also transforming into a movie memorabilia central where sometimes imperfection brought a bigger price and Gen X was coming of age by the end of the decade, flexing its very edgy cultural muscles. Hi, Columba. Will success spoil Bart Simpson? Well, he's probably spoiled enough. Everybody but what about the man who created him? The man whose simple drawings used to be reserved for just newspapers but now spend Sunday night in millions and millions of homes. Before, my fans had to be able to read to enjoy my comics, and now they can just turn on a knob and, and enjoy my cartoons uh, with The Simpsons. So uh, it's, a, it's a slightly wider-ranging audience. I have three-year-olds tugging at my uh, pant leg for autographs. <laughs> the autograph seekers today come from people attending the 21st Annual San Diego Comic Convention, a collection of comic book and cartoon fans. Matt Groening says he started coming to the comic convention 10 years ago as a struggling cartoonist. No one paid much attention to him then. They do now. He used to show up, and I used to be the guy with the portfolio full of uh, badly drawn doodles and wanting, looking for a job. Now it's uh, the tables are turned. Kids are coming up to me saying, how can I break into cartooning? Well, today, Matt Groening has broken into cartooning big time attracting fans from the convention and covering America with t-shirts and images of Bart and the family Simpson. 
Will Granny never get tired of this little spike-headed hero? I hope a picture of Bart isn't on my tombstone. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Bob Hansen, News 8, at the convention center. No, officer, you're not mistaken. I am Captain America. Sure, there are lots of comics and comic collectors at the comic convention, but you also find a collection of comical characters in every aisle. Look at these prices. Is it possible? I think not. And you might just overhear a conversation like this one. Yeah. Polanski, his wife. Well, Polanski shot his it, husband. but I mean... He's in it, too, Oh, he's yeah. the old man. Yeah. He's the hunchback. He's the hunchback. He's the hunchback. Right. That's well, Roman played, yeah. Well, who played the guy who... Ferdy Maine, the same guy that's in uh, House That Drip Blood. Comics aren't the only collectibles here, either. Old horror and monster movie videos and memorabilia are the most valuable stuff now. Well, see, these were bought by kids in the 60s, and, you know, they, they weren't really experienced painters. So that's not really an albino Frankenstein. <laughs> no, that's just the way the kid did it. All of the stuff that my mother made me throw away or wouldn't let me have in the first place would be really valuable now? That's right. That's correct. You bet. They just don't make comics like these anymore. Great stuff to show the kids. Britano Halim is here for the comics, though. This is the first time I've come to a comic book convention. I've been, like, collecting in the closet, you know, just whenever I would run into stuff. But now, all in one spot, it's a little overwhelming. I really love it. And like father, like son. Cool. Way cool. Yeah. Few collectors can afford or even want the $40,000 rarities. Most of them just love comics. I love reading comic books because they keep you young, they keep you with a sense of wonder about the world. And nowadays we need that more than ever before. Do you remember that practical joker from the fifth dimension that gave Superman so much trouble, Mr. Mixius Pitlick? Well, Superman had to trick him into saying his name backwards to get rid of him. Hmm, Saunders backwards is uh, Srednow's. Whoa, it worked. It worked. Chris, Chris Saunders, Saunders News 8, eight the, the fifth, fifth dimension. dimension. It's uh, $1,300. This is a Marvel comic from the 40s, first appearance of this character. Uh, this is a Donald Duck, also from the 40s, one of the famous Donald Duck covers. It's we a are a long way from Donald Duck. There are these, digital comics, these, video comics, and these, the Verotica comics, which have caused arrests in at least one state. Erotica, horror, and violence is a lot of what we do. Well, you grew up, and the comics got to grow up, too. But there are people who believe there's too much sex and violence in comics these days. The exhibitors here felt compelled to fly in the head of the National ACLU to discuss First Amendment rights this Independence Day weekend. We still have a perception of comic book medium being just for children, whereas globally and internationally it's an adult medium as well. I think the comics industry would rather regulate itself than have itself regulated, and uh, there is pretty, there's a pretty good movement to do that. The comic industry, in fact, has its own legal defense fund. So we've had a couple of cases this year throughout the United States that have just raised a lot of questions within the industry about what our rights exactly are. Like the music industry, television, publishing before, they say they want to protect artistic freedom. What do you make of all this? Well, I like seeing all the different stuff here because I, I think it's really cool that they can do this and just have this whole area filled with comics and cool stuff. This is girly comics. It is? <laughs> like like other stuff, I just walk right through. I just I kind of just pull them through. Even on this section over here, also. Convention organizers say they put the really adult stuff out of view of the kids. This is what they could see. Oh, that's nasty. And it's far far different from the monster, creepy kid stuff comics used to be. Carol Hassan, KFMB News 8. Comic-Con was moving into its 30s by Y2K, and it had spawned a huge worldwide fan base. And the action had outgrown the convention center with tens of thousands of visitors to San Diego filling streets, bars, hotels, and restaurants in the gas lamp. The money was flowing in, and instead of three days, Comic-Con was a five-day event, bringing millions and millions of dollars into San Diego's economy. Rumba, it's Bart Simpson, Spawn, Hi, Spawn, Batman. At the 31st Comic Con, you never know who you'll see next. I am a futuristic Jedi. <laughs> Harley Quinn, the Joker. With thousands of comic books, trading cards, and action figures, even Superman's here to add to his collection. G.I. Joe, Transformers, me. Think comics, and you probably think kids. 
This event isn't child's play. Just ask Bonnie Strickland. There is an incredible amount of creativity in a place like this. And it's just a lot of fun and it's interesting. Interesting and expensive. Comic books may have been cheap when we were kids, but some of this stuff now, much more than a week's allowance. Superhero that started all, Superman. His first appearance worth about $40,000. $40,000. Right, $40,000. $40, How many of these do you think are out there? I'd say approximately 100. With that kind of money involved, you might think about spreading your wings and giving comic book writing a try. So we went to an expert for advice. Usually late night conversations working along on insane hours uh, produce some pretty interesting ideas after a while. So lack of sleep equals good comics. Lack of sleep equals, e equals good comics sometimes. <laughs> Just the line to get into the convention center today told the story. Comic-Con is a pretty popular event. Inside, Star Wars and Harry Potter were obvious expensive attractions. Oh, Comic-Con? I couldn't handle it every week. <laughs> Spent too much money? Yes. <laughs> Way lots of money. I bought DVDs mostly. Got figures. I have a lightsaber, of course. You know, comic books, everything. See you at Comic Con every week. That'd be nice. Well, I would have a place to live. Come on back over here. Nearly 100,000 people let loose at last year's big show, and the turnout this year may be even bigger. People just pull money, credit cards. Out of oh the yeah, like have the, have like the time. Have the time. They're like. They walk through a line, buy it, and they're like, what did I just buy? You know, they're just like, what am I getting? The Hot Wheels display turned some heads, and people sat for hours trading Wizards of the Coast playing cards. But nobody, I mean nobody, could pass up the opportunity for a photo op with Darth Vader. You like the bad guys? Yeah, the bad guys. Like the Republic, so. I've never seen a Darth Vader so tall either, so. Yeah, he's tall. He is very tall. Mark Prescott, Local 8 News. Along with the craziness and camaraderie of Comic-Con. Hang out, nerd out, be with like-minded folk, buy things. The five-day convention means serious business for San Diego. It brings so much revenue to the town, the hotels, to the bars, everything fills up. So it does really well for the city. And business this year was booming from Wednesday's preview night onward. Thousands of fans filling bars, restaurants, hotels and stores throughout the area. Two and a half times the business. At least huge, huge numbers on Friday and Saturday night. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and even throughout today, it's been really busy all day and all night. Comic-Con this year drew an estimated 126,000 people, some two-thirds of whom are from out of town, like Michael Carter and his crew. I was probably spending about $2,000, actually, yeah. And that's not just on comic books and costumes. A suite at the Hard Rock, restaurants every night, hotels, uh, any... Um, accessory Comic-Cons, whatever. Whatever comes my way, I spend on. In fact, Comic-Con brings in tens of millions of dollars to the local economy every year, according to the convention center. And I feel like it's grown every single year, so this year is definitely one of the biggest I've seen. And despite the soft economy, many Comic-Con consumers are decidedly not shy about spending. They plan for it all year, so they're ready to spend. I definitely didn't feel the recession uh, this weekend. But some business owners are feeling nervous at the prospect of Comic-Con possibly leaving San Diego after its contract runs out in 2012. It's really amazing what this convention does for us. We need to keep it here. By the last decade, Comic-Con had become a staple for the entertainment industry. It drew Hollywood studios and stars to promote their movies to adoring fans. Those fans would line up for hours upon hours, all for the chance to get into one of the con's famous panels and maybe, just maybe, get the chance to ask one of those stars a question. The whole thing was also just a whole bunch of fun. Here it is, the coveted, all-important Comic-Con 2010 press pass. I've got the pass, I've got the costume, I can show you what's inside. Come with me as we geek it out and I go to save the world. 40 years old, big sci-fi fan, never been to Comic-Con. I know it's almost unbelievable living in San Diego. I'm trying to get down, but we're getting a little bit of a late start and I know it's a zoo down there. Let's go. Look what I found over here. Avatars, how are you ladies? We're good. I like the outfits. Thank you. Did you practice the language? No. Can you try and speak some for me? Uh, not really. I know that the bond is Sahelu. Oh. I know that, I remember that's what that is. So what do you do? 
Can we? Can that girl be part of your? Well, you don't have a little thing. <laughs> oh, but so I thought I can't. really. We can try. We can try. <laughs> Yeah. Not, not Just a little bit afternoon and we're on the trolley headed down to the convention center. We will see if we'll actually make it into the building. Long lines and big crowds down there already. Look, look, look. I found him. Robin. Hi. How's it going? What have you been doing? I've been hiding from you. Why? Are you still I'm just mad? kidding. No, no hard feelings. How about the other day? No, no. Okay. Where's Batman? Um. I haven't seen him around here. Here I was worried that I'd be uh, overdressed. Not so much, I'm guessing, as you look the people around. Let's go. Look, it's my son. How are you? How are you? Do you know who I am? Maxwell. You're so sweet. Are you my little boy? Yes. Oh, give me a hug. Oh, he's so cute. Look at a little Batman. You gotta love the traditional heroes. Traditional superheroes like Batgirl. Comic-Con is in its 41st year. It is huge. So much to do. So much to see. Batgirl, hey, finally I found you, Marcelo. You, you look great. It. I haven't seen any other Batgirls here. You look fantastic. You made it. Hello, Jedi Knight. I'm doing the Jedi thing. They're rocking a lot of Jedis here this year. Not so unique, but you got to admit, Marcella's perfect. Can I take a picture with you guys? We're of getting course. two. <laughs> One, two, three. Woo! So after that long day's journey, trawling down here, waiting in line, I have found my own personal heaven. <laughs> Although Comic Con is filled with imposters, all of these fans lined up to sneak a peek at the real thing. Who do you really want to see? Angeline Jolene. These people wait for hours just to see their favorite celebrities, and you just told me what? No cutting in line. No cutting in line, and you've been waiting in line since what time? About 8.30 this morning. 8.30 this morning. Yes. <laughs> After the line, they stuffed themselves into dark hall rooms, 6,500 strong for moments like these. Give a warm welcome to Angelina Jolene. Promoting her new movie, Salt, Angelina Jolie was open for questions, like the time she cracked her head shooting her own stunt. Yeah, no, and then I thought actually that I had some problem because I couldn't hear everybody well, and I thought, oh my God, I've, I've done it and I've got a concussion. I had forgotten I had my earplugs in from the gun. <laughs> Angelina sat next to one of her co stars, Liev Schreiber, and this was just one of many movies being promoted. And Jeff Bridges, ladies and gentlemen. Jeff Bridges was also on hand to promote his upcoming movie, Tron Legacy. He sat next to his co star, Olivia Wilde. Now we're trying to track down Kent and Vixen from The Amazing Race. There are thousands of booths and tens of thousands of people, but I finally found them. Kent and Vixen, hello, how are you? Hi, wonderful. Yeah. I dove into my bag of swag to find their number one fan. Oh! Rekha Mutaraj didn't ask for an autograph, but I scored her one anyway. This girl's got it going on. A couple of booths over sat Ernest Thomas, who played Raj on What's Happening, and I know you remember his list. <laughs> We also bumped into actor Steven Tobolowski. You know him from Glee and Heroes, not to mention his famous role in the movie Groundhog Day. Any chance you could be Ned Ryerson and sell me some insurance? Hey, what do you have there? Hey, you know, do you have whole life? I don't think so. You know, this is spectacular. I mean, where else can you find Polly Shore hiding out from the masses? Help! For those of you who think Polly has passed his prime, just look at what happens when I drag him out into the crowd to promote his new movie, Adopted. Hey, let's hear it for Polly Shore, huh? Yeah. It's Comic Con 2011. It's my day off, but I'm down here having some fun. Come follow me around. <laughs> Reality TV meeting sci fi. Adrian Curry dressed up. I am an Imperial recruiter. An Imperial recruiter. And basically, what I do is I lie to all the boys and I tell them there's many like me on the Death Star, and then once they <laughs> sign on. <laughs> I, I think it's a good hook. I think I'd sign up too, to be yes. honest with you. I am Darth Hilarious. The Joker <laughs> is dead. These are fans. They did this on their own. This is me. Did you buy these or did you make these? Uh, I made everything. There's always costumes. This is. I, I don't think I've seen this one before. How about Samurai Homer? I wonder if instead of dough, it's no. Yep. <laughs> How many people line up for hours just for this at Comic Con? There are so many people here. I'm a little overwhelmed. It's my first year. <laughs> they have artist David Finch, who does The Dark Knight for DC Comics, sitting down. They have an overhead projector showing him put pen to paper and do some of his work while he's being interviewed by kind of a moderator. Fantastic stuff for fans to be able to see the artist going through that process. 
It's not just comic books and toys. There's actually fine art here. These collectibles start in the hundreds of dollars. Or you can spend up to $6,000 on a life-size Terminator. For those of you that always grew up wanting to be a superhero, now you can be a member of the Justice League of America. It's pretty cool. They green screen and put you right in with all your favorites. All right, when you're ready, look at the camera right there. Three seconds. One, two, and three. <laughs> we got Superman, Batman, and Carlo. That's right, I'm in the Justice League of America. I've got that picture somewhere. Uh, these days, Comic-Con takes over the gas lamps with event installations and experiences all around. It may have grown beyond the convention center, but it's not outgrowing San Diego. Thank you so much for watching this throwback special. To see more throwbacks like this one on CBS 8 Plus, click on the news tab at the top of the screen. I'm Carla Chiquetto. We'll see you next time.